Good morning. I greet you this morning from an empty sanctuary with just a few people here recording a worship service that hopefully you can connect with and hopefully you can find the Spirit in this time. So as we go through this service, I encourage you to open yourself up to allow God to work through you in this time of worship, in this time of sharing, in this time of connecting together. Would you join me in our call to worship? Lord God, who cleansed the earth through 40 days of flood and gave your guiding law through 40 days of worship, who revived Elijah through 40 days of pilgrimage and sent your son to fight our foe through 40 days of fasting, grant us grace to enter the flood, the fire, the desert, the penance and the journey, the emptiness and the fasting that leads us to Gethsemane in the dark scene of Golgotha, and lead us at the empty tomb to see your risen Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Good morning, church family. First, I just want to say to all of our beautiful children how much we all miss seeing your faces every week and how we can't wait to all be together again. Today, we're going to talk about a small word that has a really big meaning, grace. Grace means that we all give each other a little extra patience and understanding. Life seems really different and new right now for you and for everyone else. Your teams have been canceled, your school's been canceled, you don't get to go to the park or to eat at your favorite restaurant, and you're probably starting to get a little bit bored. What tends to happen when we get bored? We fight with our siblings, we might get cranky, we might whine to our parents, we might make a big mess. And when these things start to happen, that's when we need grace. Our parents need grace towards us to help us with our big feelings. We need grace towards our siblings who might be picking fights. We need to have grace towards our family members because this is all new for all of us and we don't really know what we're doing. So when I start to lose my patience, I think about all of the grace that God has for us in the world. No matter how many times we mess up or how many times we make him sad, he still loves us and forgives us. And that, my friends, is what grace is all about.
Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Romans 8, 6 through 11. To set the mind of the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. Since the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit that dwells in you. As we enter into this time of prayer, I invite you to remember our entire congregation, our church, as we are entering into this new and different time, as we are continuing to shelter at home, be in isolation, we pray for each one of you that you feel a connection, that you know how to reach out to those in need, and that you know how to ask for help when you're in need. I pray for each one of you as we join together in prayer. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this time that we can gather together and worship you. I pray for those in our congregation who are suffering in various ways, for those who are facing illness, for those who are taking care of the ill, for those who are at home trying to do their jobs and continue working, for the children who are at home trying to do school uh, virtually, for each and every person in our congregation and our country and our world as we are facing this virus that we don't understand and we don't exactly know how it's going to affect us all. I pray that each one of us are doing the best that we can do to keep this country as safe as possible. God, may we remember that you never leave us. You stand by our side during good times and bad. We are never ever alone. Help us to be your steward during this difficult time. Help us to be Christ to one another in all that we do. And now we join together to pray the prayer that your son Thomas prayed. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. opportunities open for people to keep giving if they're able. 
Um, we're sensitive to the fact that financial situations have changed for many of you, but if you are able to give anything, it would be greatly appreciated. And here are the ways that you can make that happen. First, putting a good old-fashioned check in the mail is still a great idea. Um, you can make the check out to the church at Highland Park and send it to 5206 Balcones Drive, Austin, Texas, 78731. Again, that's 5206 Balcones Drive, Austin, Texas, 78731. You can go to our website, htbcaustin.org. You'll click on the menu in the top left corner and then scroll down to donate at the very bottom. Or you can go to PayPal. Our PayPal name is hpbcoffice at hpbcaustin.org. Again, that's hpbcoffice at hpbcaustin.org. Thank you so much for all of your generosity.
comes from John 11. It is a lengthy passage, 1 through 45, so bear with me. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard of, that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought this was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Jesus said to her, I'm sorry, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and she said to him, Lord, if you had, not, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in the spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have we laid them? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone, Martha. The sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, 
you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me, as I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We have today another long scripture, but a very familiar story. A story that might just have a new meaning for us in light of the events of the last two weeks. The story of Jesus' close friend Lazarus, brother to Mary and Martha. You remember the argument between Mary and Martha when Jesus visited their home. You also remember Mary anointing Jesus' feet with perfume and wiping his feet with her hair. This is a family that Jesus is close with, has spent time with, and Mary sends word to Jesus that Lazarus is ill, and Jesus says, he'll be fine. And he stayed put for several days. He takes his time getting back, and when he gets there, they tell him that Lazarus has been dead for four days, and Mary and Martha aren't pleased with Jesus. It's a natural feeling. I know we don't like to admit it, but there are a lot of times when we are angry with God, and it's okay. Mary and Martha believed that if Jesus had been there, Lazarus wouldn't have died. It was a sad time for all of them, even Jesus, who wept. I'm guessing we're all having a bit of those kind of feelings right now. Jesus, where are you right now? Why are we going through all of this? Why are people suffering and not able to work and not able to gather together? We can't even worship together. People are sick and they're dying and suffering. Jesus, why don't you do something? It's a difficult time for all of us. But we know the rest of the story. Jesus does show up. And Jesus says the words, and out comes Lazarus, and as the scripture says, he stinketh. Now first I'd like to have a discussion about what really happened to Lazarus. I listen every week to a podcast of four theologians, and this week they had this lively discussion about whether Lazarus was really resurrected or was he resuscitated. You know, I listen to the discussion and I honestly agree with both sides. We say that Lazarus is resurrected because he obviously has died. He's been in a tomb for four days. When he comes out, he doesn't smell so good and he doesn't look so good. So surely he died. But we know when Jesus was resurrected, he returned different, a new being. People didn't recognize him. He was clean. He showed up in rooms where the doors had been locked. Perhaps Lazarus was just resuscitated. Life breathed back into his lungs and his heart restarted again. And the miracle of all miracles, he is alive. I mean, is one really more miraculous than the other? Does it matter? Does the fact that if we call Lazarus resurrected mean it takes away from Jesus' resurrection? Shouldn't we save that for Jesus? Jesus' resurrection is followed by work that he still needs to complete and then followed by his ascension. It wasn't a come back to life to continue to live life until another death. I don't know the answer between resurrection and, re and resuscitation. 
I know Mary used the term resurrection, and Jesus reminds her that he is the resurrection and he is life. I don't know the answer, but I am intrigued by the question. I want you to look at a painting, a painting found in Capella degli Scrovani. This painting was done by Giotto, and it's an amazing portrayal of the resurrection of Lazarus. The thing I think is so amazing is that all people portrayed here are people just like you and me. Seeing this amazing miracle occur. First, I'd like you to pay attention to the disciples behind Jesus. There really is no response on their face. One has a finger slightly raised, but their faces and bodies show no response. Have the disciples really gotten to a point that they have been following Jesus around and nothing surprises them anymore? Even bringing back to life someone who's been dead for four days. I wonder if there are those of us who have spent our lives following Jesus, but we've become so desensitized to the work being done in our lives that we don't see God's handiwork right in front of us. Do we just stand around unmoved, unresponsive? Maybe a finger of recognition. If we're unresponsive in times of miracle, then how can we possibly be moved by Christ on a daily basis? I fear we can't find Christ in the miraculous. Then where can we find Christ? In the everyday and even in our own time of need. Are we like these lukewarm disciples in the picture who just stand around taking things in but not being responsive or moved? When you look at the bystanders, the people of Bethany standing around in the picture, now they have a look of astonishment, almost a look of being overwhelmed. One man is raising his hands and, and the other man is leaning forward with his hand on his chin and he's pointing to Jesus. You can tell he doesn't know what to think, but he looks as though he is on the precipice of believing. I can't help but think about those who come upon us on a daily basis. Are there things in our life that help lead others to this amazing gospel story? When people see our lives, when people hear our words, when people watch us daily, are they drawn to this miraculous life of Jesus? Or that do they just see the same thing that they see in everyone they come upon each day? I'm really drawn to the two down at the bottom who don't even notice what is going on. They're just intrigued by the stone that was once covering the door to the tomb. They don't notice the noise around them. They don't notice the stench. They don't notice the wailing. They just go about their everyday lives. We see people like that all around us, don't we? People who don't notice the amazing things that Christ is doing in our world today. People who go around just concerned about their own life and the things that are going on. In this especially troubling times, we see people who can't focus on anything but the fear and the worry. They don't see Christ and the miraculous things that are happening. Maybe we as Christians get so caught up in the humdrum that we don't notice what's going on around us. 
I think sometimes part of our role as followers of Christ is to stand up and say, look, look at the miracle. This man was dead and now he lives. There are also two women who have fallen in front of Jesus. I assume that they're Mary and Martha, praising Jesus for their brother being returned to them. What a tremendous gift they must feel like they've been given. Do we recognize the things in our life that we need to praise God for every day? Perhaps in this troubling time, do we remember that there are so many things that we need to be thankful for? For the health care system that is helping to keep people alive. For the people who are willing to go in and work every day despite their own needs at home. Or despite the fact that they're walking into danger themselves. What about the ability for us to connect together through technology? So many ways that God is working through different people during this time. And then the last thing in the painting that I want us to look at is Lazarus himself. He doesn't look so good. He also doesn't look Please. There are some who have asked the question, could Lazarus have been unhappy that he was brought back to life? The idea of going through death only to come back and realize you're going to have to experience it again in the future. I don't know what Lazarus' experience was. Perhaps his death experience was beautiful. We don't know. Perhaps being brought back to life was joyful. Perhaps it was overwhelming. But for each one of us, we can recognize that the joy that comes to us through resurrection comes from the fact that Jesus tells us that if we believe, we shall never die. If we believe, we shall be resurrected to walk with Christ through eternity. That's reason to celebrate today and every day, no matter what the circumstances. We have a Savior who is waiting for us. Amen and amen.
with us today, for worshiping with us. As you are isolating at home, may the peace of Christ be with you, and may you find ways to praise Christ in these days.